Hello, good evening, uh, friends and uh, artists, ladies and gentlemen, Susanne, video of uh, Herbert W. Franke, was one of the last artists we exhibited at the Francisco Carolinum. And now uh, Jonas Lund, it's, it's exactly the same space where we did the, the Franke show, I guess. Jonas Lund was born in uh, Sweden and uh, based in Berlin and uh, Amsterdam. Between 2006 and 2011, Jonas received his education as an artist in the Gerrit Rietfeld uh, Academy in Amsterdam and in the Pietrat Institution in Rotterdam. And he has been interested in cryptocurrencies and decentralized uh, technology since 2011. Solo exhibitions as of 2012, for example, in the New Museum in New York and the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London. And his most recent exhibition, How to Make Art in the Age of Algorithm, is shown right next to us here in the Francisco Carolinum in Linz. And as Jonas is a musician as well, so we felt we need a piano as we have a, as a museum, a piano collection with more than 400 uh, pianos. So he selected one. His Bösendorfer was a hard selection uh, process and uh, he wants to play something for you. And I guess, Jonas, we start because we are talking right now, or we talked right now that you're a Swedish artist. So I guess you have to play something Swedish for us. Yes, that makes sense, yeah. It's, I will I give some background so it makes a bit more sense. I'm not a musician, it's my hobby. I never work with it. I keep it away from the art to keep it holy and safe, right? Because as soon as you put things inside your artistic practice, it becomes corrupted by the art world. Uh, but I played clarinet since I was six. But we don't have a clarinet. And then I played piano for a while, but I'm not very good. So it's a bit, uh, not so. But uh, I can play some parts later. Uh, but it's true when it comes to Swedish music, indeed I mostly play Swedish or Finnish music on the piano. And it's not, it's not because I'm a nationalist, <laughs> it's not that. It's like there's this guy from Sweden called Jan Johansson, he was very active in the 60s and 70s, who reinterpreted Swedish folk music in a jazzy way. Like went around the archives, dug up these songs no one had heard for like a hundred years, and then reinterpreted them on the piano. And that became like the symbol of this, like the Swedish soul, basically. It's really like everybody in Sweden knows these songs. So when it comes to playing the piano, these are the songs you go to because it's really like the most, uh, the ones with the most emotional load, I would say. But yes, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, if, there was no real question there, but uh, yeah. yeah. That may be later. Yeah. Jonas, your academic background is uh, in photography. When did contemporary network systems and power structures become important for you? Yeah, I can go more in depth to this too. There was, I mean, there are two key moments for this, I think. The first one is way back before I even studied, when I went to a sort of preparatory art school that you go to in Sweden or elsewhere to get into the art school. So it's like a pre-art school, which was one year uh, study. I was totally obsessed about photography at this point, which I am not at all anymore. But during this time that we got, we had a visit from a duo of Lars Wilks and Martin Schibeli. Lars Wilks is uh, passed away last year, sadly. He's a professor slash artist slash writer. And Martin Schibeli, which was his curator. And they had just published a book called How to Become a Contemporary Artist in Three Days, which was such a good book for someone who's just starting out as an artist. Because it was really like a step-by-step -step guide towards unraveling the power dynamics, power structures, hierarchies of the art world. Like completely unmasking all the, uh, let's say, like uh, the confusion, let's say, or like this... Uh, the allure of unknown, the things you can't understand. Basically disregarding all international art English and just describing this is how value is produced in the art world. Largely through a network of influential players 
and their subjective opinion that then becomes subjective somehow. So that how to make art, how to become a contemporary artist in three days is really like a, a total introduction to the art world system. It's slightly cynical, one could say. It sounds very cynical, but only partially because most of it's actually quite informative guide on how you make art, right? Uh, and that was like a, a complete shock to me in the greatest sense of the way, like a total, I guess it's an apocalypse, right? Not apocalypse in the sense of ending, but the apocalypse in the sense of massive transformation. Because before was someone who were completely naive thinking about art in one way, and coming out after this introduction is someone who thinks about the art world as a like hierarchical power structure that the higher up you are in the art world, the more influence you have in determining what's good and bad. And the core principle in the book is the institutional theory of art by George Dickey, which basically means that art is whatever the art world says is art. So then our good art is whatever the art world says is good art. And that sounds super corrupt, but it's also how it works, kind of. And then the art world is very corrupt in some sense. So then that becomes uh, like endless materiality for trying to work out how those like methods, how those networks operate, basically. So that's been quite uh, important for a long time, I would think. I think actually it's only one critical moment in this, not two, as I said. Then coming back to the photography, I studied photography for three years doing a bachelor at the Ritfeld. This was hyper focus on photography. So then when you finish this bachelor's degree, you don't want to touch photography at all after. It's really like, ugh. Also because during the bachelor, I discovered like net art and programming to make work. And then using this like, what they always refer to in photography, the apparatus to make work felt incredibly limited. Because on the one hand, you have something which is a device, you point it towards something, press the button, and out comes the work. And on the other hand, you have a computer with the internet with an endless amount of possibilities, with like instant distribution, make something in the morning, the whole world sees it in the evening. So it's a much faster process, also much less history to relate to. And I think this is something with photography and painting and most, let's say, not traditional, but a lot of mediums have a sort of increasing burden of knowledge that you have to know in order to not like make oopsies or repeat work that's already been made many times. Same with net art, but the net art history, and history is much shorter, much worse documented. And you see these works being remade over and over and over again, but in different formats and not. By the way, if you have questions throughout, please just ask, I would say. So that was somehow the background. Yeah. And that was like, so Ritfeld was, okay, let me just close this one. Ritfeld was 2006 to 2009, and then Pete Swart was from 2011 to 2013. Yeah. Yes. So a word about algorithm. So, yeah. But you, your work is definitely very much inspired by algorithm. So it seems that you really love to deal with uh, algorithm. And uh, for example, you have pro programmed a database that tells you who sells well, which curators are important, what role museums play, and how decisions in terms of selling, selling are made, or where we, you should be present. Did your algorithm choose us? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, I would say so. I mean, there was, like if one, yeah, algorithm, how many in the audience is like totally dead sure what an algorithm is? Like by show of hands, just want to know. Totally no. Mario Klingemann knows, yeah. He's a, he's a programmer nerd, yeah. This is true. Yes. Very good. So, okay, we do the basic intro first. So algorithm is basically, for me, a set of instructions to be executed by a computer or other methods. It doesn't have to be a computer. It's like math is kind of a set of algorithms. You know, two plus two equals four. It's also an algorithm. It's like input, something changes, output, right? So algorithm is something which, when I started, let's say started this body of work, 2011, 2012, was this kind of endless buzzword. 
an endless excuse in a way. You can justify anything you want with an algorithm. It's kind of the same right now. Like it's just became just that the algorithm became more. Right? But like what Mario Klingemann knows over there, like through neural networks, artificial intelligence, in a sense, is also just a set of algorithms, right? And through that, you can justify whatever you want because you say it's a black box algorithm. So when it comes to trying to understand this value production mechanism of the hierarchical power structure, my sort of first approach to that was to, in order to understand it, first you need the data. So you need to quantify all the different aspects of the art world. And that started in 2012, 13, where I started to make an art world database, basically scraping all different websites for art world, art world data, like uh, Artifacts, Mutual Art, Artnet, Eflux, ArtC, etc. Put it into a database with all the different relations between curators, artists, not collectors, because that's not public, but museum directors, galleries, institutions, auction results, etc. So you had like a sort of a comprehensive overview over how the relations function, right? to try and understand who's actually making the value happen in this. The work in the show, the top 100 highest ranked curators, which we'll soon see on the video, is the first result of this database. Because then it's a curatorial ranking algorithm that looks at all the curators in the database and then assigns them a score based on where they worked and who they worked with. So if you've made a Venice Biennial, you get a lot of points. If you've curated a show at uh, unknown project space in Bucharest, maybe you get less points. So then it makes really like this total hierarchical structure of saying, and the top 10 people are really like art world powerhouses. It's like Francesco Bonami, Jan Huth, Evans, or Hans Ulrich Obrist, Klaus Biesenbach, etc. Like all these people who made, who makes Venice Biennials documentas and stuff like this. So uh, through this, you get an overview of, okay, so these are the people to look out for at the openings when you're out and looking like out making work, whatever. So you see, oh, I recognize this guy. It's like, ah, okay, hello. And it's also like a uh, who's who in the art world, like who has the most power or not. So I can just talk and talk, but okay, coming back to the algorithm. Yeah, the algorithm, this is the question. So the algorithm is this magical tool and it's like for me, it, it appears in so many different works because it's one, a curatorial ranking algorithm, but it's also just a set of rules to like be executed. So it's a bit like in, when the medium or the materiality is programming, programming is basically the same. You just define a bunch of rules that happen in a sequential order or based on sort of a synchronous setup. Yeah. Uh, so you have like this. So it, like you go, so even like the terms of service you agreed to when you enter the show, which you can see there on the wall, that's in a way also an algorithm because it's just a set of rules that you apply to. And then you can apply this algorithm on yourself and see how you change. Right? So it's, it becomes like the catch-all phrase that brings all the works together in a way, I would say. Yeah. A word about your GLD, hmm? a, a word about GLT. Yeah, about uh, four years ago, so you gave the go-ahead for the self-tokenization experiment, and this resulted in the Jonas Lund token, which has played a central role in your artistic work ever since. Can you please explain your Jonas Lund token and uh, your artistic uh, practice? Yes. Yes, yes. So, Jonas Lund token. Uh, yeah. I can explain it now, it becomes like a perfect narrative. Because the Jonas Lund token started by the idea of uh, like distributing decision making in my work, like optimizing the decision making, let's say. So if you, let's say the basic assumption is that everything I've said is true about the art world. That the higher up you are in the hierarchy, the more influence and power you have in determining what's good and bad, and what becomes platformed and not. What if I could have an advisory board that advises me on what to do or not, which is these people that have the most power in the art world? If they advise me what to do, anything I do based on their advice is automatically the good thing to do because it's a circular loop of being totally hedged, right? Because they make the value, whatever they say is the truth. If they advise me to go and do this exhibition, that is the best decision. So it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of hedging decision-making, basically. So how it works in practice, and this is the Jonas Lund token room in the show. Uh, how it works in practice is I made 
uh, voting shares in my practice. So if you have Jonas Lund tokens, you get to actually participate in voting on what the work should look like, what I should do, should I participate in this show, or should I go on a sabbatical, and what city should I live in, and things like this. So the other idea is that you have a sort of financial incentive to vote with the best strategic decision because the better my career performs, the more valuable the token becomes, basically. So it's also like a financial direct incentive to play. And similar to corporations, you know, like in Apple or Google or whatever, there's voting shares. So if you buy voting shares, you also get to participate on the yearly uh, shareholder meeting and cast votes, even if you have like 0 0.000001%, whatever. Still, you get some agency. That was the core idea of the you know, Saloon token work. And now it's taken many different shapes and forms over the last four years, four and a half years. It launched in March 2018. It, technically, it's an ERC20 token on Ethereum, if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. Yes. When you compare this with what they about this exhibition and shareholders, mm. did they give you recommendations or did they vote? They did not because uh, it was such a last minute thing and they are kind of slow. And then, because how it works in practice, if they have to make a decision left or right, I basically have to make four times the amount of work to prepare options. Let's say there's a vote with four different options. I have to make these four options and then they have to cast a vote. And in this exhibition came about very last minute. It was made, basically the whole show was produced in two weeks. So there was no time simply <laughs> for that. And the more realistic point is that I'm still a majority shareholder. So all the advice is just like, uh, basically to just reinforce the decision in some sense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of problems with Jonas Lund token project, which I've discovered over the years. Uh, it's like officially called a decentralized autonomous artistic practice, which is not true because it's a centralized a non-autonomous artistic practice, because it all fall, like it all hinges on me doing all the work, basically. So it's not a it's not decentralized at all, basically. That's the one problem. The second problem is that the only real incentive you have to participate right now is to either be seen on the website or do me a favor. Because why else would you vote? Like only if you're really invested in my work. And most people. What I've learned as well is that most collectors and people who really are invested in your practice, they don't want to make any decisions for you. They want you to make all the decisions yourself. And then they come to your show and be like, wow, that's so cool. That's it. So um, also, incentives is really difficult. Like, how do you incentivize participation? And I know there's hundreds of people scratching their head right now with all their newly started DAOs questioning the same thing. How do you make it make sense? And I think there's very few DAOs that actually work, DAOs being then the decentralized autonomous organization. And I think Ethereum is one of them that really works. Because Ethereum, the cryptocurrency blockchain, is in itself a DAO. That's how it's like managed, you know, in a way. They do manage it through something called EIPs, which is Ethereum Improvement Proposals, which is really nice, I think. Yeah. How can they vote? For example, I guess in Leipzig, the work uh, which we exhibited, oh, you did true. kind of, no. you, did, you did the form, yeah. and, uh, and your shareholders had the possibility to influence. Yes. Yeah, that, like, in, we, the last show together was in MDBK in Leipzig in 2019. 1920. Yeah, curated by Annika Meyer, sitting in the back. The show was called Linking Bio. For that show, there was two Jonas Lund token pieces. There were proposals in themselves that could then later be approved or disapproved by the board. And in that case, the board had uh, added opinions through a chatbot that is on the Jonas Lund token website that gives you lots of options. You make like a dialogue tree, basically. And then from there, from there it went. Yeah. So that was more direct result of sort of Jonas Lund token work yeah, in that show, I would say. Can you share another example with us? Yeah, I think that, like the most... So there's also a rule that if you have more than 100 tokens, you could submit proposals to the board. 
So like all the proposals don't have to come from me, but you can make a proposal. And last year, end of the summer, there was a proposal submitted by a board member called Rule, who suggested that I should go on a sabbatical for half a year. And that would start in October and last until March, would include no social media, no computer, and no phone, and no work, and no participation in shows. So like it, I could read and meet friends, that's what he said. And that was a vote that was very close. And I had lots of things to do in this fall. Like, and I really didn't want to have a sabbatical for half a year in like the crappiest months, like from October to March. What are you going to do? Like sit at home, no computer. And it was really close, this vote, uh, where in the end, no sabbatical won out by like 4% or something like this. And I think it was a very clear-cut division of the board members as well, where all the gallerists, collectors, were like, no way. And all my close friends were like, yes. So it's really like, a, do the work or don't take a break. Yeah? And I think uh, hindsight, it would have been much cooler if the sabbatical went through and I just disappeared for half a year. Because then it gives more credence to the principles. Other decisions have involved like deciding which city I should live in between London, Berlin, Amsterdam and countryside Sweden and there's a lot of like the banners that are outside on the on the facade like I don't know if you saw it there's a bunch of banners outside which were originally in a show in Kindle Contemporary in Berlin curated by Anne and Johanna from Office Impart called Behind the Screen the design of those was also a direct result of board member votes, basically, like between four different options and stuff. So it's basically, I think the more I realize it, it's basically also the third layer to the UNESCO token project is, it's basically a way for me to try and remove myself from the decision making process, right? Like if I have a board that decides, I don't have to take the final responsibility for the decision. It's a bit of like, maybe it's a coward move, or maybe it's like, some level of uh, like aiming for complete nuance, like no like black and white binary thing. I can always be somewhere in the middle because uh, I find making the final decisions quite difficult, mostly. So a lot of my work is trying to just remove myself from the... I make the system that makes the work, you know? Most artists just make the work. I make the thing that then makes the work because then the thing is responsible. And I'm not. She's weird. Yeah, she should go see a psychiatrist, I think. <laughs> Shit. The shareholders vote, but they don't can make decisions, right? They vote, they can submit proposals, and then the rest of the people vote, but they can't like make, uh, they can't just make decisions for me straight away. No, not yet. There's some things launching soon in a couple of different exhibitions which will be more like streamlined production where the board members just produce the work like themselves and then it becomes NFTs and then... But it was funny because yes, two days ago someone messaged me on Twitter. His name was Jonas Lund. He was based in Seattle, Washington. He was a welder by trade and he offered to sell me his Twitter handle because he had Jonas Lund in one word and I have Jonas underscore Lund and he wanted $200 for it. I don't, I mean, I don't care about the underscore, I kind of like the underscore. But then I had an idea, I should not only commission him to make some welded sculptures, because then it's Jonas Lund who made them, so then, you know. But I should also just uh, outsource the Jonas Lund token project to him, because he's equal amount of Jonas Lund as me. So this is perfect. And actually back in the day when Facebook was still a thing, I had a Facebook group called Jonas Lund. It had 11 members. All Jonas Lund. That was it. And every time there's like on the 29th of March in Sweden, there's Jonas, it's the name day. You know, like we have name days in Sweden where everybody gets a day of the year that is for you. And then that group went wild. Everybody's like, happy name day, happy name day. But there are some other. So maybe it can become a, Jonas Lund token can become a cohort of Jonas Lunds. That would be quite good. I think, yeah. When is the next possibility to vote? For example, because I found my name on the, on the wall. Yes, as you a are indeed a shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was just a proposal that closed the other day 
which was for upcoming show in Sweden in Kristianstad, Konsthall, where there was four different options about how to make the install. And the, the option 3-1, it's already closed, unfortunately. Option 3-1 where, because it was a big space, but very tiny production budget, so then I gave four options on how to make the show. And the, the option, the one was that I would ask the art installers slash museum employees to make action painting, action painting Jackson Pollock paint install in the show. Because that seemed cheaper than to print wallpaper and stuff. So there are going to be a bunch of people making an abstraction on the wall soon. I wonder if it's going to look good or just really 70s. Yeah. That's a good question. I guess we should do another show because I, it's, it's really a pity that we couldn't uh, I, yeah, voted so. ask the shareholders for their opinion. So Absolutely. We can do a second show next year where everything is based on shareholder decision making. And then we make a shareholder meeting as a big party with a huge table and invite everybody. Yeah. It sounds great, Annika. Annika, make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about That would be great. Yeah. I see. All yeah. right. I want to ask you a Questions about the metaverse. So metaverse. last year you exhibited at the uh, Berlin Koenig Gallery in the metaverse Decentraland. And um, is this platform suitable for you and uh, also for, um, for, your, for your business model? Does it work? Did I, it work? I mean, the show worked for sure. I enjoyed it very much to make. It was like a, also like a Jonas Lund token show, kind of with that shareholder table with like a lot of people. It's, it's nice. I'm not actually sure what to think about it, because I think like it, contrasting that show with this show, obviously this show is nicer. Like this is, because you can make this in virtual, and in fact I made this whole show in those two weeks of planning it in 3D, like in a 3D software to make, lay out the whole exhibition and stuff. And there's certainly some like potentials there but I don't know, like, I mean, I think since Facebook became meta and invested all of their profits towards making a metaverse, it also kind of makes it much less interesting automatically because then it just becomes something else. But as a replacement for reality, for sure not, but as a sort of extra additional layer of exploring 3D space, for sure. And then, I mean, you did a lot with the metaverse too, with, uh, with all the different exhibitions and stuff. And for sure, it's, ni it's a nice way of, exploring 3D, in a getting a more spatial idea of the work. But it's, for me, it's still kind of net art, more than exhibition, more than replacement, more than anything, for now at least. Yeah. I think in the case of the show at the Centerland, it was really nice to put together. Because it's then metaverse, you basically there's no restrictions for what goes. You, know, you can do whatever you want. Like, there are no physical rules. Although that show was very much responding to making a show as a pitch to get to exhibit in the real space, right? That's my be like, this is what it could look like in real, which is cheeky. But yeah, no, I don't know. Like, I haven't yet formed my final opinion on the metaverse. I'm very curious to hear if the pros and cons, actually. If it's just, I don't know. What do you think? We are asking these questions with all our exhibitions right now. Like, we have three exhibitions just, just talking about but the, the, the main issue is just to explain that uh, Metaverse is, has a very close relation with us, with human beings. Because our very first dream we had as a child was also an excursion in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Metaverse. Because it's a kind of parallel world. And uh, we also want to say that the uh, always artists visualized the Metaverse the parallel world, not uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So this is also one of the reasons why we're doing these exhibitions, just asking what's the metaverse, in which direction it goes, how does it promote artists? And this is the, and I guess, the reason for the exhibitions we're doing right now. For example, also the exhibition of the Crypto Wiener, it's exactly the, the, the issue, just uh, explaining what it, what it is. Don't worry about it, it, it doesn't harm you, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the, that show is like a reverse of the metaverse. Just like you take the metaverse and then make it real. So then it's a meta-metaverse, I guess. Yeah. 
Meta, meta, metaverse. <laughs> meta. Is, well. Also, the crypto we just say it is once. <laughs> it's yeah. the meta, metaverse. Yeah, meta, metaverse. I think it's quite good, yeah. I mean, like meta, it's really sad that Facebook became meta because everything that's meta that talks about itself through whatever it means, it's like deeply fascinating to me. And a lot of my work does that too. It just goes in a circle, talks about itself in a meta way, which I understand is really becomes very insular and like circular and kind of like institutional critique, critique in a way. But it's still really a nice methodology of like trying to understand how things like mm -hmm. fit. I don't know. Uh, something else I thought, I just seeing that almost most of the work in this show has like a terms of service or terms of ownership or some type of contract attached to them. Which I think is again coming back to the algorithm that the contract in itself is also kind of like an algorithm. Because it's just like black and white rules, this is how it works, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do. And I love making those type of rules. That makes sense. I don't know. It doesn't apply to the metaverse. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. The curators. Yeah. A word about the future. So, I mean, we talked about the uh, next exhibition, next yeah. Jonas Lund exhibition yeah. in one of our museums. So, ah, let's yeah, see yeah. how it yeah. works out. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I have to ask okay. the board members. Yeah. So. But uh, what uh, phenomena are you currently dealing with? And uh, what can we expect from you in the near future? This is a good question. There is, I'm, there's a couple of exhibitions coming up, a couple of Jonas Lund talking shows, one in uh, Knihanstad in Sweden, and then one at Zurich Kunsthalle, which opens beginning October, and then one in Shenzhen in China in November. But the mo that will be mostly like Jonas Lund talking related explorations. The most immediate show is coming up at Office Impart, end of, no, beginning November, which I've been really thinking about what to do. Because on one hand, you have like the sort of innovation, let's say, within like the technosphere right now would be all the text to image or image to image neural networks, artificial intelligence, like DALI or stable diffusion and mid journey and all of those things, which somehow both one can make the claim that that's the end of art or the end of the image. And at the same time, you can also make the claim that now you need artists more than ever because you just get so much nonsense coming out of it. But at the same time, it's like you're facing a kind of very grim looking autumn where pretty much everything feels like it's going for a worse downturn. Like inflation is sky high, everything is going to crap. So then I'm thinking it's either you go hard into the disaster, late stage capitalism grossness, or you find a place, a refuge of just enjoying stuff. So I think the show for Office Empire will just be jokes and memes and nonsense stuff, like very Instagram ready kind of, to make some sort of claim also, because there's a lot of conversation in this show about value production coming from the top, bottom, like, okay, so the curators, the museum directors, the sort of influencers, like, like collectors, the board members of the big museums make all the value production happen. But I think more and more, it's just more that just the market makes the value. Like you make this claim that you talk about value in a European context, and it's a lot of different values. You have aesthetic value, like cultural value, aesthetic, like uh, kind of change value, political value, kind of activistic value. Whereas in an American con context, value is just money. It's just like, okay, how expensive is it? Like, what's the value? Can I buy it and flip it for a profit or not? And I think, sadly, that's somehow becoming the reality or like the self-fulfilling prophecy that that's the only value left, right? Because it's also the only value you can properly quantify. And in this sort of endless measure to death everything, like Margaret Thatcher's fault, right? Neoliberalism, measure, 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 measure. Then in the end, the market is the only thing left. So then to make market ready work seems like the only logical conclusion to just end. In a way, like this show becomes like a sort of end of a 10 year chapter. Then maybe the next is to find the next chapter. And maybe that's being less conceptual and less tricky and just more, more, more uh, straightforward, I think. But I'm not sure. No. Do you have advice? 
why this exhibition is so important for you? I think it's... I've never seen all these works together like this before. Because also over the last 10 years, I've moved around a lot. Like, so I never really had a studio in these 10 years. Like the computer is the studio. So then to see everything gathered in one place with this wallpaper that just traces it sort of in a chronological order, it's both very exciting and a bit terrifying because then you really get confronted with everything I've made kind of since 2012. And I really wonder if it's good or not. And then sometimes I really love it, and sometimes I'll be like, ah, is that it? You know? So it's, it's really very exciting to see. And some of the works in this show I never saw before, physically, <laughs> which is also weird. That happened during the pandemic. You just, okay, the work's shipped there. And they'll be like, ah, yeah, it's fine. Like, everything is the computer, basically, right? So then I think in that sense, to see everything together is super exciting, because I get a different, my relationship to it changes as well. So that's really nice. I think, yeah. 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 <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Jonas. So we came to an end almost. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Questions. We have a microphone a over there. <laughs> Uh, can you explain this work uh, where is your replica of you as an avatar is uh, walking in the game engine? I'm curious yes. what's the concept behind. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a game called In Search of Ideas, which is a, like a 3D model of myself running around in an open world space that's changing. Right now, it's really like without purpose in a way. There are sort of, uh, the idea is to release it as a game which you can play. The animals you see is the, uh, as playable characters in the game. It's a Unity, a Unity engine game. I don't recommend working with Unity, if anybody cares. Like, please choose Unreal Engine, I would say. Unity is such a pain. Uh, so the plan is to release it as a game which you can play, and then there's like a sort of uh, uh, a metaverse space for me that I own, that I can make my own exhibitions in. So it's a game you like, have access to it for sure free to download, and then it will update itself with new scenes and new things to consume. Right now, the game has been programmed to be self-playing. So there's an AI uh, controller that controls the virtual Jonas to just run around looking for animals right now. So the exhibitions and stuff will come later, hopefully quite soon, but I really, I, Unity is very frustrating to develop in, I have to say, just as a thing. Yeah. But uh, so it's kind of like half finished. I think the self-playing works quite well because then it's much more of just like, a, more of just a space that is being explored. Right now the time of day and weather is matched to wherever it's exhibited. So right now it always shows you what the weather is outside. It's also inside the world in Linz. So it's mostly rainy. It's more beautiful when it's sunny, but it's been a while since it was sunny, so, yeah. Yep. Mario. Okay, I will step this way now. Oh, yes. Hey. Uh, well, you have quite a few projects which are kind of open-ended or in a way require constant attention. Mm -hmm. So, like, are you worried about, like, taking out loans of your future self's time or kind of, like, how do you handle time management? <laughs> That's a good question. It's like you're hedging your own time for the future, yeah. Um, I don't think about it, but it's really true that when you make a lot of software-based work, which I'm sure you know too, especially when it's being exhibited and stuff, that there is like a technological burden that just is ever increasing. But in a way, I like, Way back when I was studying, I used to make websites for people. And that's the same, like you make a website and then you're forever married to this person until they switch websites. So there's something, but I've recently learned a really good tactic for all of this by my friend Doma, who said, you can just let it escalate. So if you don't have enough time, you just let it escalate. And then in the end, you get an email that says urgent, and that's when you answer. I think, yeah, I think that's okay. I, I use that technique, yeah. yeah. But I don't have to do it very often. I think I'm also, 
for better or worse, very fast in making stuff, which I think uh, if there's any kind of self-improvement, I think I wish I could have more time to slow down a bit. But, uh, but it also makes me do a show like this in like two weeks. So I guess it's okay. Yeah. Good and bad. More question? There's a question over there. I'm just posing by the piano, basically. I don't actually play. It's really cool, huh? <laughs> Welcome. No. No, um, actually, Mario gave me the microphone, and he has also kind of a DAO with this uh, NFT. And you have, um, do you recommend other artists to, to kind of have this kind of DAO advisory board uh, in their career, or no? If I would recommend it to other people, uh, no. <laughs> I don't think so. No, because I think, I think DAOs work best when there's a group of people with a common goal. Like, which is really like, so you don't unite around a person, but you, you like unite against a common goal. Because then you have equal incentive to really participate. Because I think in general, making a successful DAO is incredibly difficult. Like, and I don't think the Jonas Lund token is a successful DAO. Like, it's hardly a DAO, right? Like, almost not. Like, and most of the ones I see that are working are just pure financial speculation, right? Like, you join to get tokens, you do things for the DAO to get tokens that then one day might be very valuable and then you can cash out and be happy. And I think, uh, like, yeah, it's difficult. But then at the same time, you have, for me, like Ethereum, which I also said, like Ethereum is like the most well-functioning DAO of all DAOs, right? Totally decentralized, distributed, like decisions come through votes, through like the core dev team meeting, implementing things. That is like a common goal, which makes sense, right? And then other DAOs, I'm not sure actually. Maybe. I'd be, yeah, if you have, I think, for me, the problem with Jonas Lund token is the Jonas Lund part of it, like in a way, because the goal is for sure to remove myself from the project and have it be autonomous, sort of governed by all the different uh, uh, board members, like similar to the Abraham, uh, uh, whatever it's called, Abraham AI DAO thingy, uh, right? And then I can just step back and be free. But then if that's surrounding me, that would never work. You know? But if it was like an anonymous artist, whatever, that everybody can feel agency in, then maybe. But then the artist game is so much based on like personal brands of artists, so I doubt it. Maybe in other, other fields it could work. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. It's a long answer. Yeah. Questions? Totally clear. Other questions? Close? Yeah, one more. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, one more. Let's make a score system. Um, yeah, well, your your works, although they have a lot of humor, I can sense the pain of being an artist, and really a cruel system behind. Uh, what? Um, how do you? How? Um, how do you survive as an artist? Do you have a strategy, or or how? Yeah, how your your kind of uh, week or day looks like, and. Uh, is it an option to slow down at all? Because you mentioned a um, couple of times, but as a, let's say, contemporary artist on the going up on the career, is, is it an option to slow down at all? And I think it's a, it's a good question. I think for sure, like, if you would ask anybody, is it an option to slow down? I would say, like, yes, for sure. I, and I made a great step this year because I actually declined an exhibition for the first time in a, such a long time. I'd be like, no, I can't make it. Which is usually I just, my principal idea has always been to say yes to everything. Because why not? Like, because there's time, like I, have to, I can make time for it. So I just like say yes, 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 yes. Which is a really bad strategy, I would say. Like if I would give advice to anybody and also like through teaching, giving advice, it's like it's better to make yourself rare. Like to have sort of a, a, a high, barrier, high, high boundary to like do shows. Because then you can ensure that everything is always fantastic. But I'm still like learning, so I think it's better to just like do, 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 do. The main problem with art, I think, I mean, this is where music comes in, which is so wonderful, to, like to practice songs on the piano or clarinet, whatever, is that you kind of know when it's good. Like you hear it, and then you know, okay, did I hit the right note or not? 
it's a very fast feedback system. Whereas when it comes to art, it's like the feedback system is so slow. Because for it to work on things, it's like concept, you don't actually really get much feedback at all. So it's a very slow, and like the key of optimization of like improving things is to get fast feedback. You know, like deliberate practice is all about getting fast feedback, understanding what works, what doesn't work, so your brain can like feedback loop itself into working better. But with art, it's pretty much more or less impossible, I think. So one just has to trust one's intuition in a way, and then maybe you learn long term. But it's very slow. That's where the music comes in because it gives you the most amount of like brain break in a way. It's like the single focus, improve or not. So yeah, the typical day of a life in Yonaslund is just in front of the computer. Yeah. But um, how do you survive? Do you apply for grants? Uh, you sell your work? You do NFTs or? Uh. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I used to make websites. It's been a long time since. I think I've been full-time artist since 2014, when I did my first solo show in Los Angeles with 40 paintings that sold out before the opening. And then you get, just get like... Uh, and then since then, for sure, relying on an art market to support your practice is a very perilous um, situation, I would say. It goes very much up and down very inconsistent. Some years you have great success, other years you have like no success. Walid Rad, uh, Lebanese, is he? Walid Rad did a super beautiful project about this called the World Atlas, where he looked at the artist trust pension fund and looked at a lot of data and concluded that if you have market success as, as an emerging artist, the vast majority get three to four years of being like collected and then the market moves on. It doesn't mean you can't come back to it, but it's very difficult. So it's kind of like you have these moments to max out in your profits, basically. So to find like a, a setup for a long-term sustainable artistic practice, it's difficult. Right? There's a manifesto in the show called 21 Truths for a Continuously Successful Artistic Practice, which is quite good because it covers a lot of these different things. And one of the first points is you have to work, which I think is true. You have to work. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, most of the time I support myself either through. I actually did an overview of all the invoices I sent some year ago, and then it was an equal split between teaching, commissions, artist fees, and sales. So it's totally hedged. Like one can collapse, the other can cover. I'm not sure if it's still the same, I don't think so, but something like that. Yeah. But about the sales, like in, in your practice, very interesting that you do painting and you do digital and conceptual and kind of all kind of uh, formats. Uh, uh, if, when it comes to sales, then what do you sell, sell normally? Mostly paintings or...? Uh? It used to be like that, yeah, for sure. Uh, like, also because like 99% of the art market is painting. It's like the ultimate art object, right? It's like easy to install, cheap to make, easy to transport, beautiful on the wall. Uh, but I think it's a, now it's a mix, uh, paintings, NFTs, like websites, um, like websites not as NFTs, right? You just sell a piece. Uh, like some video art. Also like the VIP in the show, also things like that. Like uh, yeah, it's, I would say if you're like a collector that collects my work, it's both nice because you get a lot of options of like stuff, but also it's quite a challenge because it's not uh, such an easy, you certainly won't make any massive profit in auction, yeah? like the paintings perform very poorly in auction, so, which is okay, yeah, not enough manipulation. And finally, we also will buy one of work, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. It was Thank a you. pleasure having you here, Jonah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful exhibition you made. Thank you, Annika Meyer, for curating this amazing show. And then see you next um, year, maybe. Yeah, to do another sounds good. Show. Yeah, we shake on it. With we do it in the I love okay. this shareholder ah. idea. Which museum <laughs> should we do it in? Well, well, let's figure it out okay. afterwards. Yeah, great. Yeah. We will find yeah. a way. So we Fantastic. Have yeah. more museums and then. You should ask the board. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. Skip those. Guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, last word, uh, Victoria. Do we have some drinks out there? 
I see. All right. We have one fridge. This is Jonas Lund's fridge. It's in his exhibition space. Just walk in, take a beer out of the fridge, yes, and it's fine. For sure. It's for free. And yeah. if it's necessary, we will fill it up. Yeah. Anyhow, so next panel starts in, a, we'll say, in about five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.